this amazing brain. In our last lecture, we looked at the things that are going into the mouth. We looked over here at not only mouth, but other areas which are affecting the functioning of our brain. We defined what the frontal lobe was, where our reason, intellect, judgment and will are, that they're fully developed at the age of 30. Now we're going to have a look at the mental or emotional aspects of the way the brain functions. To do that, we're going to go over the seven laws that govern the functioning of the brain. And the first law must always be Newton's third law of motion. To every action, there is an equal and an opposite reaction. It's the law of cause and effect. Effect follows cause with unvarying degree all through nature. Never should we blame the effect as the cause, and sadly that often happens. I'm going to have a look at a few sadly common things that are happening today in the mental area, and we're going to have a look at what they are and what are the possible causes. One is panic attacks. What is a panic attack? A lady told me this. She said she woke up in the middle of the night one night, she's about 53, and she was in total panic. Her heart was racing, her skin was on edge, felt like electricity. She was terrified. She woke up her husband and said, quickly, you must take me to hospital. Something terrible is happening to me. He drove very fast. He didn't know what was going on. Got to hospital. It was a very busy night. They brought her in. Her husband brought her in to the nurse and the nurse said, yes. And she said, something terrible is happening with me. My heart is racing. My skin's on, on edge. I'm feeling total terror. The nurse said, fine, go and take a seat. We'll be with you shortly. Now the nurse didn't know, and the lady didn't know, and her husband didn't know that it would actually be ours. The nurse never planned that. But what happened was, 15 minutes later, she went and got the doctor, they were about to call her in, and an ambulance came in with its siren blazing. There'd been an accident down the road. Someone was dead. Someone else was already on life support. So of course, the priorities quickly shift. The lady heard the sirens, she saw the people running, and at that point her mind was diverted. As you will see as we go through these laws, diversion is one of the laws. She was watching what was going on, she saw that a crisis was happening, and she watched it all happen, it all took about half an hour before things settled down again. The nurse was about to call her in, and then another ambulance arrived with them. Sirens blazing, someone had had a cardiac arrest and they were doing mouth to mouth. Can you see the scenario? It was probably about four hours later the lady was sitting there, her husband was asleep. It wasn't the nurse's fault, they had planned to see her, it's just that crisis after crisis after crisis came in. By this stage, in fact, within probably half an hour, the lady felt all right, but she thought she'd better stay around. She thought she was going to be seen in the next 10 minutes every 10 minutes. She woke her husband. She said, we'll just go home. They're very busy. They went home. She went to sleep. She woke up in the morning. She felt a little bit silly, but she also knew that what she felt was real. So that day she did a Google search because she had heard the nurse say to another nurse, panic attack. And she thought, I must have had a panic attack. She did a search on the web. She came up with one area that ticked every box for her, uh, early 50s, starting to go through menopause, had been on the pill for about 10 years when she was younger, da, 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 she ticked every box. And she searched that line and she came a little bit further and she came to the Anna's Wild Yam Cream, a hormonal balancing cream. She found out that when a woman's on the pill, it boosts estrogen and depletes progesterone. And progesterone is the hormone that keeps you calm that prevents the panic attacks. She thought, well, that's all me. She went a little bit further and you could send away for a DVD called The Dance of the Hormones. And in that DVD, she learned about the importance of the eight laws of health. She learned about the importance of drinking more water, of having a more plant-based diet. She learned about the importance of exercising, of going to bed early. She started to go to bed earlier. She learned the dangers of the sugars, the alcohols, the caffeine. So she stopped alcohol, she stopped sugar, she stopped caffeine. She started to use the sunshine a little bit. She checked her home, had fresh air. 
After two months, she felt fantastic. After two months, her friends were saying to her, what's happened to you? She'd lost 10 kilos in weight. She said, well, I've just been implementing the things that I've heard on this DVD. At the same time, she was taking the Anna's Wild Yam Cream, which was going to boost her progesterone, her happy hormone, and little by little get her estrogen under control. Two and a half months later, she woke in the middle of the night. Panic. Heart was racing, skin felt like it had electricity on it. She was experiencing total terror. This is what her feelings said. You see, the back part of the brain is where the feelings are. And in the first scenario, that had been the boss. But when the feelings started to rise up, quickly frontal lobe kicked in. Frontal lobe kicked in and said, aha, it's one of those panic attacks. Aha, I know what it is now. Aha, I know how to conquer this. What I'm doing, eventually I will not get them. She slipped out of bed. She went in and got a crystal of Celtic salt and a glass of water. She put the kettle on, got a chamomile tea bag went out onto the veranda with her hot cup of tea, still a bit hot to drink. She breathed in deeply. She started to do some stretches. Then she sat down and drank her tea. The whole time this was happening, her heart is pumping, her skin is on edge, her feelings are screaming at her, but she's not listening. Got that? She's not listening. She's basically saying to herself, settle down, this will pass. This will pass. And in 15 minutes, it had passed. She slipped back into bed and went to sleep. Same situation, but seen at, seen at from totally different eyes. What had made the difference? It was knowledge. It was understanding what was happening to her. The old proverb, knowledge is easy to him that understood. She now understood what was causing her panic attack and she knew how to conquer it. She just had to get over this little hiccup. This lady told me that she had about three more panic attacks over the next six months. Last time I talked to her, she said, it's three years later and I haven't had another. How nice. You see, the back part of your brain is your feeling part of the brain and it makes a bad boss. It doesn't mean feelings are bad. Feelings are not bad, but they're not a good boss because feelings go up and down like the wind. Her first situation, her feelings were the boss. No wonder. <laughs> that's, that's the only guide she had was her feelings. But the frontal lobe part of the brain is a very good boss because every decision that this boss makes is made according to reason, intellect, and judgment. Basically, you could call it cognitive behavioural therapy. She just changed the way she saw it. And what enabled her to do that was knowledge. Knowledge on why this was happening and what she could do to overcome it. But let me give you another story. And this, is, this also was told me. Same situation. Rush to casualty. It's a quiet night. So the lady's given Valium to calm her down and a referral to a psychiatrist. She sees the psychiatrist. He says, I found the cause of all your problems. You get panic attacks. Now the night she got a panic attack, it had a profound effect on her. That made a strong pathway. And when her, when her specialist told her, you get panic attacks, what did that do to that pathway? It made it strong. Yes, put a bit of Rio in it. He said, you'll be on panic attack medication for the rest of your life. May I quickly add here, not every doctor says that, but this one did. She went home. Her mother said, what did the doctor say? He said, I get panic attacks. He said, I'll be on medication for the rest of my life. Can you see what's happening here? The more you frequent those pathways, the stronger they get. Science shows that they are physical pathways in our brain. Two years later, this lady came to Misty Mountain Health Retreat. She's now to the point where she can't drive her car. Her panic attacks are so strong. So I gave her a script, a prescription of what to do when the lightning strikes. I said, the first thing I want you to do when you feel that panic arising is laugh. She said, I won't feel like laughing. I said, you're absolutely right, but you will. <laughs> what did I say when I said you will? I made a pathway. I said, just pretend to be a kookaburra. 
almost makes you giggle. <laughs> and while you're hoo, 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 ha, ha, laughing, get a crystal of salt, a glass of water, get a chamomile tea bag, all the things that this previous lady had done. I said, you'll conquer it. But I said, the hardest time will be the first time. Because we like going down the paths of least resistance, don't we? <laughs> and this has got resistance. It's not a well-worn pathway. This is the path of least resistance, well-worn. It's like going on a bushwalk and being told you can go anywhere but not on the path. It's pretty hard to go through the bush but on the path. Ah, oh, it's easy. That's actually exactly what's happening in your brain. And this lady did it. I don't know anyone that likes being on medication. I don't like it. And I don't know anyone that likes having panic attacks. Eventually, the pathway became stronger and stronger. This is the pathway of conquering panic attacks. And because she stopped frequenting the panic attack pathway, can you see what's happening here? The new pathway is stronger. How long does it take before the new pathway is stronger than the old pathway? Let's make that a little bit thinner. Science shows us it takes 21 days, 21 days to create a new habit, 21 days before her old pathway, the panic attack pathway, is replaced by a new pathway. The new pathway is stronger than the old pathway. And when the new pathway is stronger than the old pathway, when something stressful arises, guess where she goes? Down the new pathway. Isn't that good news? <laughs> This lady rewired her brain and science shows us that we can be rewiring our brain right up until the day we die. That's the good news. You've heard the old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Wrong. You can. <laughs> Where there's a will, there's a way. If you say you can, you will. If you say you can't, you're right. You won't. It's as simple as that. You see, our feelings are like a wild horse and they go all over the place. They need the bridle, woo up, woo up. Your bridle is your frontal lobe. That's your board of senses. That's your board of critiques. And can you see if someone is taking all of this into their body, their board of senses, their critiques are not very loud. They can hardly hear them. <laughs> what about depression? By the way, I've seen many people conquer their panic attacks by the things that I just described. Isn't that good news? Depression is not a cause. Depression is an effect. The medical definition of depression is a chemical imbalance in the brain. What's my next question? Why? What has caused this imbalance? Let's have a look at what causes the highs. Sugar causes a high, wheat causes a high, caffeine causes a high, alcohol causes a high, tobacco causes a high, MSG causes a high. All of these highs come with corresponding lows. They're transitory highs. They're just crutches. They just hold you up for a little time. But because they are transitory, because they are brief, because they are really delusive, they all come with the corresponding lows. Sugar blues, that's why the book's called Sugar Blues. That's the wheat blues. We've got another book called Caffeine Blues. They all cause the blues. They give an initial brief high, but they come along with this long corresponding low. What's a hangover? It's not a very real low. Desperately doing anything to get the next cigarette. Desperately. We've got one we haven't got here, which is drugs. I can't understand myself, a beautiful young girl, going into prostitution to feed her drug habit. That's the effect that the high of the drug does. They're constantly going for it again to try and maintain that high. These are all transitory highs coming along with very real lows. Of themselves and absolutely together, they can cause depression. Depression is a chemical imbalance in the brain. A chemical imbalance can be caused by a lack, so we've got a lack of oxygen. Oxygen vitalizes, invigorates and electrifies the body. Lack of oxygen can cause depression. Lack of exercise can be one of the causes of lack of oxygen. Lack of sunshine. Sunshine in the day 
causes a release of serotonin at night. And serotonin is a hormone that makes you feel good. Lack of sleep can cause depression, especially in the hours of powers that we talked about. You see, when you're sleeping in the proper hours, there's a release of serotonin. So sunshine and sleep are both affecting the release of the serotonin. Lack of water. Our brain's a hydroelectric system. Lack of water, lack of hydro, lack of electricity. Negative thought patterns can be developed in a brain that is dehydrated. Lack of rest. Lack of rest can be different to lack of sleep. If you're a computer programmer, your rest might be climbing mountains. We've got many monomaniacs today. Have you heard of a monomaniac? A monomaniac is someone who only develops one part of their brain. My son William's in Brisbane at the moment and he's getting very busy as a handyman. <laughs> he was brought up on the farm. He knows how to do lots of things. He said, no one knows how to do anything in the home. People get him to go and change a tire. People get him to go and fix a washer on the tap. <laughs> And the people are doing that are usually computer experts. They're monomaniacs. There's only one part of their brain that's developed and that's the technology part of the brain. There are many men today who can't chop wood. They can't change a tire. They don't know how to do a grease and oil change on their car. They don't know a lot of basics, maintenance around homes. And there are a lot of ladies who they're very good on the computer, but they can't knit, they can't sew, they can't cook, they can't clean, they can't... Parent, there are so many who don't know the basics today. They're monomaniacs, just developed one part. You see, an imbalance is causing depression. And when you have a monomaniac, it creates an imbalance. So we'll have to put here, lack of balance. And lack of balance can be created by a lack of rest. Often if I've been consulting with people all day, lecturing all day, I'll go home, get on my hands and knees and dig weeds. Or I'll go and sew, or I'll go and knit, or I'll go and cook. <laughs> Something totally different to what I've been doing all day. We need to have a balance in our brain. And to have a balance in our brain, we need to rest our brain. And one of the best ways to rest the literary part of our brain is to Climb a mountain. <laughs> so it's just doing something different can be the best rest that you give other parts of your brain. In, in Exodus, the Bible talks about a special rest that God gave. And I read the Bible when I was 25. And I got to Exodus where the Ten Commandments are. In the Fourth Commandment, God said, Six days shalt thou labor and do all their work, but on the seventh day, rest, rest. I remember as a young mother, I thought, how do I do that? And then I realized that if I have a visitor coming, I've got everything ready. If I'm going out, I've got everything ready. I'm just going to see that day, the seventh day that the Bible talks about, and I'm not going to do any cooking on that day. I'm not going to do any vacuuming. I'm not going to do any washing unless a child vomits, then I might. <laughs> I might wash. So I made prep so that I could do that. You see, being pregnant or breastfeeding non-stop for 14 years, I was a very busy lady and I'm up in a rainforest and there's no electricity, so I'm busy. But you know, it revolutionized my life and it gave me the rest and the balance in other areas. I used to go on bushwalks with the kids. I'd, I'd sit and chat with the kids. Usually they'd say, mum, look at this. And I'd say, yeah, I'll just put the load of washing on the line. Yeah, I'll just do this. I'll just... <laughs> and this gave me one-to-one -one with the children. And still to this day, Michael and I love work. We never stop, except for one day where we stop. <laughs> we get the rest and we give our brain the balance. Lack of progesterone can cause depression because progesterone is called the happy hormone. I meet many women in menopause age who are suffering de from depression. And when I do a history on them, they're on the pill, the pill depleted their progesterone, boost their estrogen, and basically those levels are still out. I've seen many people, especially women, conquer depression by going on the Anna's Wild Yam Cream, boosting progesterone, implementing the eight laws of health, and then little by little, they're able to ease off their antidepressants. Good news. Lack of minerals can cause depression. There are two minerals that work together. 
One is calcium and the other is magnesium. And these two minerals are what gets the messages down that arm. Calcium constricts, magnesium relaxes. Calcium constricts, magnesium relaxes. This is happening split second. That's how the messages come down that arm. Lack of calcium and or lack of magnesium can both cause a deficiency in the messages ability to get down that arm. Lack of vitamins. especially the B vitamins. The B vitamins are probably the most famous vitamins in uh, helping people get proper brain function. But probably the most famous of all the B vitamins is niacin, nicotinic acid. About 1% of psychiatrists today are using nutritional medicine to help mental illness, and that would be their most famous. Some doctors are using up to about 10,000 milligrams of nicotinic acid. That's 10 grams. Not forever, it's just initially till we conquer the situation. We're looking at the imbalance that can be caused or the imbalance that can cause depression. Excess. Excess food can cause depression. This is a big one in Australia today. Australia is suffering from an over and abundance of food and an overeating of food. When the stomach is burdened with too much food, the nerves are irritated and that can irritate the whole system, especially the brain. Excess stimulation. This is the opposite to rest. One of the best things parents can do for their children is keep life simple. Have big expeditions into the bush to get kindling. <laughs> big expeditions into the garden to kill the enemy. Boys love that. Pull all the weeds out. <laughs> Picking up the pine cones for the fire. These are the things that I do with my grandchildren. And you know, when they visit me, they say, have you got any work for us, Grandma? We're good workers. So good to develop really good work ethics in the children. When Parents don't teach their children to work. They deprive them of the joy of accomplishment, which is a lovely thing. Many kids today don't know how to work, but they're pretty proficient on the iPad. A lot of, lot of um, parents are really proud when their two-year-old can handle the iPhone or the iPod. It is nothing to be proud of. Kids are smart. <laughs> the most important thing children should be learning is to obey their parents let them know there's a consequence if they're not and use the will to develop their minds so that their intellects develop the way it's supposed to develop. So make sure there are times of quiet. Excess pain can cause depression. Pain is debilitating. One has to look at why the pain is there. I'm surprised at how many times we're able to reduce pain by simple hydrotherapy treatments or poultices. We're looking at what causes a chemical imbalance in the brain. The brain can be poisoned. This in itself is causing an imbalance. What poisons the brain? Mercury, all your heavy metals poison the brain. Alcohol poisons the brain. MSG poisons the brain. Chemicals poison the brain. Mold poisons the brain. Drugs poison the brain. These all have a poisoning effect causing neurodegeneration, which of course is, is the cause of dementia, Alzheimer's. Something else can poison the brain and that is negative thoughts. We have no say over what people say to us, but we have total say over what we do with what they say to us. You see, a negative thought may come into our mind and AA say this, I think it's well said, we have no say over the first thought, but we have total say uh, over every thought after that. You see, a thought is like a breeze. Notice that this nerve cell is like a tree. And here are all the little branches. A breeze comes in and it wafts through the dendrites, the branches of the tree. And it is our choice whether we keep that thought or we let it keep going. And if we keep that thought, it's basically like we build a little nest in the dendrites. And if it's a negative thought, Dr. Carolyn Leaf in her book, Who Switched Off My Brain, she shows how little thorns can grow 
in between the dendrites when we entertain or cherish negativity. And those little thorns have the ability to damage the tissues. These are your psychosomatic diseases. What does cherish mean? Love. What does entertain mean? Come in, stay for a meal, actually stay the night. Do we do that to negative thoughts? No, they must be allowed to keep going. One girl said, I get negative thoughts coming in all the time. I said, join the club. We all do. It's what we do with them. Let them keep going. Don't let them build a nest in your dendrites, which causes thorns to develop, which can be very damaging. One lady said it to me. She said, I, I like it. I like to think of it like this. We've got our remote control from the television. Something comes on that we don't want, we just change channel. We just change channel. We just change channel. And that's what you can do with negative thoughts. Just change channel. Just change channel. And remember, practice makes perfect and practice makes permanent. What this means is, what I've shown you this morning, is that these things are something we can make a choice on. And as you can see, they have a dramatic effect on the way we think. Dr. Neil Nedley stated in his lecture that I attended on depression, he said, genetics cannot cause depression. Isn't that good news? Even if both our parents committed suicide, we need never go there. Remember, genetics loads the gun, lifestyle pulls the trigger. Genetics cannot cause depression. Lifestyle tragedy cannot cause depression, and every heart has its sorrow. It's not what happens to us, it's what we do with it. But he said, you throw a few of these in, he calls them hits, and the scales are tipped. We have no say over genetics, we have no say over lifestyle tragedy, but we have total say over this. Never would I want anyone to think that I'm implying it is their fault they have depression. No, 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 many are sick through ignorance. And most people don't know the power of these simple lifestyle changes that can directly affect the way that we think. Dr. Neil Nedley stated that there are over a hundred causes of depression. I haven't given you a hundred here, but I've given you quite a few. No, depression is not a cause, depression is effect. And that's why the detective hat has to go on and have a look at all the things that may have brought together so that the effect of depression is happening. Before we move on, there's one last, and this is a Bible verse. I'm sure we all know it well. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. It's more than a nice saying. It's divine law. And that law states that whatever you give out, you shall receive again. Now this can be scary and it can be great. When is it scary? It's scary when what we're giving out is not good because that law states it's coming back again. Now this can be incredibly helpful when someone has been terribly used, abused. Often people say to me, well, they need to know what it feels like. I say, maybe no, maybe so, but not by your hand. Because if it is by your hand, that law states it will come back. No, the second law gives the key on how, to how we can free ourselves from painful pasts through the law of choice. Forgiveness is the choice that can free us from painful past. One writer wrote it like this, forgiveness sets the prisoner free. The prisoner is me. It's the best selfish decision you can make. Forgiveness does cut the chains that bind you to painful past. Forgiveness gives you wings. It gives you freedom. One lady said, I don't want to free them. I said, you can't free them. You can only free yourself. I have seen many people who are physically sick because they're bitter about a terrible experience where they were badly treated. And when I say to them, have you forgiven? Often their response is they don't deserve forgiveness. And I say, absolutely right, but it's got nothing to do with it. And they will probably never know whether you've forgiven them or not. In fact, if you don't forgive them, you keep them chained to you. 
How many people do we meet who have been through a tragic experience and it years later and they're still hanging on to it? <laughs> let it go. You can let it go. It's a frontal lobe decision. It is not a feeling decision because if it was, we would never do it. I'm about to tell you a scientific fact, and it may sound very flippant, but it's a scientific fact. Fake it till you make it. Fake it means I forgive. Why do you fake it? Because you don't feel like doing it. But frontal lobe says you just got to do it. You just got to do it. And you know, when you keep doing it, I forgive this person, I forgive this person, I forgive this person. <laughs> It might start like that, but remember, practice makes perfect and practice makes permanent. That's what you fake it till you make it is. One lady said to me, I couldn't even say their name the first two weeks. But she said, I pushed on, I pushed on. She said, after two weeks, I could say their name. After three weeks, she said, I had no anger when I said the name. She said, after two months, I saw the person in the street and she said, the hair didn't go up on the back of my head and I didn't feel like running up and wringing their neck. I actually had almost a warm feeling. <laughs> Incredible. Incredible. The third law explains this. You see, our words affect our feelings. That's why you have to be very careful on your words because what you say affects the way you feel. So when this lady forgave her abuser, it changed the way she felt about her abuser. She says she was, pro she was totally unprepared for that. It was a pleasant surprise, a pleasant side effect. Forgiveness is a choice. It's a frontal lobe decision. Don't listen to your feelings. Just tell them to settle down because they'll come into line because <laughs> your words will affect them. Love is a choice. Love is a frontal lobe activity. It is not dependent on feelings. It is a frontal lobe decision. You see, when we fall in love, we fall in love with character. And character should get more beautiful with age, whereas the grey hair comes and the wrinkles come and the tummy gets a little bit bigger. So if that's what you've fallen in love with, you'll be very disappointed. The movies are wrong. You've probably noticed that. They must be, the movie stars that play the roles. What are they onto? Their third and fourth partners. No, no, no. Love is not a feeling, it is a principle, it is an, and it is a choice. And when, the, when you make the choice to love, then the feelings follow. That's how it should be. Forgiveness is a choice. We've done that one. Happiness is a choice. We have no right not to be happy. And when I drove past the rubbish tip in Nakuru, Kenya, we drove slowly past the rubbish tip entrance and we looked in and saw little children running out with the happiest smiles you've ever seen. Where do they live? In the tip. What do they eat? Rubbish. And they're happy. <laughs> happy is not dependent on things. Happiness, like love, like forgiveness, is a principle. But there is a temptation in the human brain to refer to feelings. Feelings are not a good guide. Feelings need to be under the control of frontal lobe. We forgive and we love and we are happy because reason, intellect and judgment tells us this is the best thing to do at this point in time. It's like a friend of mine. She had a difficult birth and this little baby cried all the time. And he was a bit of a strange looking child. He had big thick glasses and a cowlick on the front. And by the age of seven, she had to get help. She couldn't stand this kid. Couldn't stand a bar of him. And did he know that? Oh yes, and it made him worse. I remember I used to visit this friend and she'd fuss over my little children because my little James had these beautiful blonde curls and these big red lips and her little boys there skinny with a cow lick and big thick glasses and oh, she didn't like the look of him at all. <laughs> so she went to a psychologist. She said, I just need help. He said, what you've got to start doing is you've got to start 
um, commenting on some great things about your son. She said, you don't understand, there's nothing. He met him and he sort of half agreed. <laughs> no one liked this child. And the more no one liked him, the worse he got. He said, what I want you to do is I want you to say, I like the way you walk down the corridor. Um, I like the way you walked up those steps. That's where she had to start, in the tiniest little thing. And you know, something happened. She started to actually like her son. And guess what happened to the son? <laughs> His behaviour settled right down because she was starting to say some positive things about him. You can start so small, remember? She had to fake it till she made it, and she made it. Your words affect your feelings. Her words weren't only affecting the feelings of her son, they were affecting her feelings. And love began to grow. Be careful of your words. You can't let them all out. You see, the fourth law states that your words reveal your feelings and you cannot let them all out. Proverbs 29.11 states that the fool utters all his mind, but the wise man keeps it until afterwards. Another Proverbs 17 verse 27 says, Even a fool when he holds his peace is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Another Proverbs, Proverbs 13 verse 3 says, He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. But he that openeth wide his mouth shall have destruction. You would be surprised at how many Proverbs talk about this little member here, the mouth. <laughs> be careful on that mouth because your words affect your feelings and they affect the feelings of everyone around you. Some say it's your right to speak your mind. It is your obligation not to speak your mind. I remember down at our health retreat in Melbourne, I came in one day, we had 18 guests, and I knew that one guest was on Slippery Elm. It's a powder that coats and soothes the gut. And the guests were there about to have their supplements and there were 18 Slippery Elms there. <laughs> now I know I would have been a fool to open my mouth at that point. I looked at it and went, oh dear. And then very quickly, you see frontal lobes kicking in. Frontal lobe says, settle down, Barbara. Remember frontal lobe is foresight. Settle down, Barbara. How are the staff going to feel if you say anything? It's going to imply that they don't know their job. And what's that going to do for the guest confidence in the staff? So you see very quickly, this is split second stuff. I smiled at the guests, I smiled at the staff, and I went into my office. <laughs> I quickly thought to myself, won't hurt the guests to have slippery on this morning. <laughs> it's a very safe home. Half an hour later, two staff members came running and said, oh, we're so sorry, Bob. <laughs> we're so sorry. I smiled. I said, what can we do to prevent that happening again? <laughs> Let's have a look at the charts we have. In. And they, oh, did I win their heart? Because there's not a person on the planet that hasn't made mistakes, is there? <laughs> I'm shocked at what parents say to children. I think, don't you know they're going to grow up? Don't you know they're going to remember? And have you seen that little slogan on the back of the car? Parents, be nice to your children. They're going to choose your old folks home. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Life serves back in the coin you pay. Yeah? What goes round comes round. Be very cautious. Be very cautious on your words because your words affect your feelings and they affect the feelings of everyone around them. Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is that that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. And I think we've all felt the piercings of a sword. But do you know who it pierces the most? The speaker. We had a girl visit us one day and something went wrong and she lost it. She lost it with Michael, with Howard. She came to lose it with me. And I said, can I just say something? And she looked at me and I said, you don't realize this, but this, this, this happened. And that's why that happened. It was, you know, it was a mistake. She'd made a big mistake. She jumped to conclusions. 
Proverbs 13, 18 says, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and it is shame to him. We need to keep our mouth shut and get all the pieces of information in place before we speak. Because notice what the proverb says, because it is folly and it is shame to him. And it is rarely what it appears, isn't it? I found that as a mother. It's rarely what it appears. I have to hold my mouth and I have to wait and find out what's happening. Your words affect your feeling. They affect the feeling of everyone around you. Your words reveal your feelings and you can't let them all out. Some say it's your right to speak your, not, your mind. It's your obligation not to. But I'm upset. We'll go and chop some wood. We don't have wood. Uh, go for a run. Get on the exercise bike. Have a cold shower. Have a big glass of water. Go outside and sing opera for five minutes. <laughs> Don't speak until once again frontal lobe is boss because this is a bad boss. Oh, how many words have been said that would have been best left unsaid. Hmm? And how many words haven't been said that should have been said? How often at a funeral are these people saying all this stuff about this person and that person through their life never heard those things? Your words reveal your feelings, so be careful with them. There are some things that need to be said. But the, it's Colossians 4 verse 6, it says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. You see, with your feelings, if they're in charge, you get fight or flight. But when frontal lobe's in charge and a crisis arises, instead of fight or flight, you get pause and plan. Where do you pause and plan frontal lobe? Remember, that's foresight. But when feelings are in charge and a crisis arises, there's your fight and your flight. Oh, what a problem this tongue causes. And James chapter 5 gives a very good explanation of this tongue. Oh, such a little member. Oh, but what a fire it can start. But if frontal lobe is in control, which it will be if all of these are out of the equation. And if the body and if the brain's well hydrated, it's eating nourishing food, it's exercised, it's had its proper sleep, no stimulants going in, sunshine, fresh air, frontal lobe will be working well. So you will be able to pause and plan. I taught my boys a proverb at a young age. I wanted to raise boys that could pause and plan, not fight or flight. Because I know what a scary thing it is for a woman to be at the hand of an angry man. So the proverb is Proverbs 16.32. It says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Number five is the law of adaptation. It's only ten years that Science has acknowledged we have a changeable brain. It's called neuroplasticity. Neuro meaning nerve cell. Plasticity, when you melt plastic, it molds to the shape of whatever you put it on when you have melted it. But the Proverbs talks about the law of adaptation. Proverbs 22.24 states that Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare for thy soul. Because of the law of adaptation. And Proverbs 13 verse 20 states, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. Because of the law of adaptation. Because of the law of adaptation, our brain has the ability to grow, and our brain has the ability to shrink. So I'm going to give you a terrible growing scenario and then an excellent growing scenario. Have you heard the story of the fish that got away? Every time the story is told, what happens to the fish? Gets bigger and bigger. Every time we relate negative experiences, do you know that they grow? And who would want them to grow? Some people are relating them every day and they're getting bigger and bigger. It's what, like one lady said to me, oh, I'm just getting sick of the sound of it. I know he suffered. I know he suffered in the war, but I, I can't bear to hear it anymore. And with that negativity, what's growing? All the little thorns. And that man was beginning to get physical ailments because of these negativity thorns in his brain. 
Well, what's the wonderful scenario? The wonderful growing scenario is this. Our brain has the ability to develop. Once the brain cell dies, it's gone. It can never regrow. No other cell is like that. But this one nerve cell has the ability to develop 70,000 dendrites. Every time you learn something new, another dendrite. Say you're a pianist every time you, you learn a new piece. I like knitting fine lace every time I knit something new, a new pattern. My husband recently, or a few years ago, learnt to fly a helicopter. I think a lot of new dendrites came because he said when you, he did the, he learnt the Bell 47, that's a manual. He said you're doing five different things at once, one with one, right foot, left foot, left hand, two things with the right hand, all at once. <laughs> his teacher had never met a 50 year old man who got his solo as quickly as the young men. How many 50 year old men aren't doing all that? Michael did have some drugs and some marijuana in his youth, so he has sustained a bit of damage, but he's obviously developed what remains. That's the good news. 70,000 dendrites. That's why we should never stop learning. Never stop learning. A.A. A. Milne, the poet, said, the world is full of so many things, we all should be as happy as kings. My husband's not interested in gardening or knitting or sewing or cooking. <laughs> Obviously, you choose things that, that you like. But science shows that you, learning a musical instrument is one of the top on the list. Can you play a musical instrument? Well, it's time to learn. Please spend the next few hours choosing your instrument. <laughs> Triangle's out. Don't need a lot of skill for that. Some may question that. Also learning a new language. Learning a new language also helps to grow a lot of dendrites. My music teacher, yes, I am attempting to, and I will learn the recorder. <laughs> she told me that learning to read music is like learning a new language. Memorizing, especially the Bible. The King James Version of the Bible I find the most poetic and I love to memorize from the Bible. Some think that I have a talent, but I don't. It's just hard work. Let me relate something to you that will take a few minutes but took me months to memorize. There's just strong pathways in, there in my brain now. It's Proverbs 22 verse 17. Bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart to my knowledge. For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. They shall withal be fitted in thy lips that thy trust might be in the Lord. Have not I made known unto thee this day? Have not I written unto thee excellent things in counsel and in knowledge that thou might know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou might be able to give an answer to them that are sent unto thee. Now you can see why I memorize that. I think it's so pertinent to what I believe my role is in making you all know what is the certainty of the words of truth. I'm not clever and I don't have a talent. It's just hard work. How long does it take before one verse is solid in my mind? <laughs> Maybe about 21 days. I'm like a dog at a bone. I just keep at it and at it and at it till I have it solid in my mind. And then I can not say that for two months and then I can just say it. If I don't say for a year, I might need to go over it a little bit and get it, get it clear. Well, what's a terrible shrinking scenario? If you don't use your brain cells, you will lose them. When these brain cells go into stagnation from ya from lack of use, they die. And once they die, they're gone. But what can also cause a shrinkage is these thorns, which are causing damage. Well, what's your good shrinking scenario? When we forgive everyone, anyone who's ever hurt us in our life, we turn painful past to dust. And when you turn painful past to dust, there's no bad smell to draw you down to that memory anymore. And so the pathway to that memory actually shrinks because of lack of thoroughfare down that pathway. Isn't that good news? I've seen so many people who've struggled with, with abuse in past. They have made a decision to forgive and they stop relating the story. 
You see, there's no bad smell anymore. It's just a little pile of dust. That's the good news. And Dr. Carolyn Leaf, she takes it one step further. She says, when you forgive everyone, anyone who's ever misunderstood you, ever hurt you in any way, you turn painful past to dust. And that night, let's say you do it right now, today. Then tonight when you go to sleep, glial cells are activated. And these are the brain's vacuum cleaners. And there are more glial cells than nerve cells. And they come along in the night while you're sleeping and they vacuum clean up those old nests and those old thorns that have been damaging for too long. Science now shows us that forgiveness has a physiological effect on the brain to spring clean the brain. Isn't that good news? Amazing. Number seven, the last and the final law is the law of diversion. The law of diversion states that when something is so firmly denied as to refuse any hope for it, the brain has the ability to divert to other pursuits. Don't you love it? <laughs> what are the old sayings for that? When God closes a door, he opens a window. And my eldest son, James, at the age of 13, he said, Mom, sometimes the window's bigger than the door. Good frontal lobe activity for a 13-year-old. One Italian man said, no, no, no. In Italy, we say when God closes one door, he opens two. <laughs> and I think we can all relate to that in our life, that experiences that we have thought would be maybe the worst thing that happened to us have been an open door or stepping stones to greater things, that the trials in our life not be rocks to crush us, but stepping stones to greater things. That's why it's like this. If you say it's great, it will be. And if you say it's bad, it's will be. In our brain, there are two polar opposites. There's fear and there's faith. And from fear come all the negative emotions. And from faith come all the positive emotions. And the Bible verse for fear is 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, where it states, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love and of a sound mind. In other words, fear is the opposite to sound mind. But over here on the other end of the scale, we've got faith. And faith is a frontal lobe activity. And the verse for faith is Hebrews 11 verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And down in verse 6 of that chapter, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God, because God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And there's one way to strengthen faith. Faith grows strong by earnest conflict with fear and doubt. So that's how you get rid of fear and strengthen faith, by going into conflict with it. It is a choice factor. My daughter Julia found this one. She's a lover of beautiful sayings. Hope and faith are inseparable companions and hope sees the invisible, feels the intangible and achieves the impossible. These are frontal lobe activities and it is in the frontal lobe part of the brain where God communicates with man. In Isaiah 1.18, the Bible says, come let us reason together. It's a choice factor. God is not in every human being. You would never say God was in Hitler, Mugabe, Stalin. No, God gave mankind the choice. But oh, what a gamble. It would mean some would choose wrong. And when people choose wrong, innocent people suffer. What a wonderful gift that God has given to us. The ability not only to choose him and choose life, but the ability to make a decision today that can change our life around. Choice is a law. And choice is a function of the frontal lobe. And remember, your will is like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. These are the laws that govern the mind. This is like a toolbox. And when law it is, is adhered to, mental health responds. Mental health is the result. Let me finish with one verse it's actually a few sentences that I found in an old book. Right physical habits promote mental superiority. Intellectual power, physical strength, longevity depend upon immutable laws. 
laws of health, laws of the mind, immutable laws. There's no happen so, no chance about this matter. Nature's God will not interfere to preserve men from the consequences of violating nature's law. There is much sterling truth in the adage, every man and every woman is the architect of their own fortune.